considering your intimate experience with the caribou and the amount of work that you put into trying to preserve caribou herds in the lower 48 in DC um, what does it mean to you um, to know that that they're extirpated gone yeah. yeah yeah that's a difficult one to wrestle with as you say you know I, I I put six years of my very first part of my career into this and it was a uh, I was exposed to all these wonderful things about an international cooperative effort to make this happen uh, international interest in this and and a, and not only uh, conservation of the animal from a law side of things but then going and transplanting these animals there so it was a huge effort and then a lot of effort way past me much past me many people did all kinds of things. So to, after all that effort to see them gone, on, on one side as a, as a professional biologist, um, it's, a, it's a good lesson in knowing there's, there's, at some point there's some things you just can't, it won't work. So it wasn't for lack of trying that they've been ex become extinct and extirpated in the United States. Um, I do think that um, we commonly want to think of, and I know I had all these discussions, especially back in my career, about the line, Canada, United States. And if there's one thing I've learned in my career in terms of wildlife is like, that doesn't matter. So if we just erase that line, if you all re erase that line from your head and go, they were caribou there, and now they're gone. Well, this United States and the state of Idaho and the state of Washington lost their caribou, and that's a, that's a terrible thing. But it's also a bigger picture in terms of their their declining, and they're going away. And we've we've done a tremendous amount of work, we the big we, to try to keep them in play here. But there's bigger forces that are that are happening that I think need to be addressed. At our scale, I think we tried everything we could. But I think some of those bigger things need to be addressed for us to be successful. And, and my fear is that if, if something isn't done, and the caribou is a prime example this way on larger scale is, is that animals this way, um, you, have a, you have an animal that's a, a, a huge four-legged ungulate. This is not a small, insignificant animal and it disappeared, it became extinct. And that, that, that animal one after, animals one after another will go the same way as caribou is. They'll disappear such that when they're gone it just ends with a whimper. That there, there won't be any notice. It was only the last one or the last 10 or whatever. And they were on their way out anyway. Because that's the way all these animals will go. If we don't try to address and then this has been an important lesson to me is tactically we can do everything really good at a at a localized operational scale and that may not be big enough enough to address the larger more strategic issues that need to be taken care of and whether that's um, you know something on like global climate change or something at that kind of scale those are the things we need to do to manage for our native wildlife and to keep them from going the way of the caribou if we don't want that to happen. I don't know how to phrase this, but can we, can we live in a world with an animal like mountain caribou that doesn't need us in that world in the sense that the world they inhabit is one that we do not inhabit, um, and it's hard for us to inhabit, um, and hard for us to preserve for precisely that reason, because we can't go up there, we can't recreate there. And so can we have, can we have a caribou world within our world, or is that an impossible task? I think it's impossible now. It is not possible. We own this planet. So to your point is that those caribou and 200 years ago 
were living in that forest in that rugged country and they dealt with it as as they be and sans us humans but then we've come in and we've punched a highway we've opened up and developed technology that allows our recreational access at all kinds of, of seasons and we're harvesting trees and affecting their habitat on a scale that meets our needs not theirs and now we've done things that are at a global climate level so i think we're t we're talking about you know all species and all wildlife this is another way to think of it they're now ours before they weren't ours they were just out in the forest and they owned themselves and they were this but now the way we've affected this planet and everything is we need to think about them as ours and and coming from a, a state agency we always referred to this as a public trust we keep the public trust for the public um, so we viewed it that way. I don't think the public necessarily viewed it that way. And it's like, well, it, that salamander's mine. It's a public trust thing. That elk is mine. It's public trust. It might have been that we regulated harvest or managed, you know, hunting. But in terms of perpetuating and keeping that public trust, I don't think it, it necessarily translated very well. And now I think that's become even more important and more apparent with the level of the scale of we're changing things and also how we need to think about wildlife belonging to all of us and it's it's uh, our planet now as before maybe it was shared now it's ours so these are management reliant species now all of them including carbon up carbon down transplant Predator control, highway crossings, don't harvest, do harvest, don't pollute the stream, do pollute the stream, all conservation reliant, our decisions, our planet. No, nothing is untouched anymore. Not one inch of this planet we haven't touched. It's great. <laughs> a big responsibility. It is. It's a, it's a way we can perhaps prove ourselves. Do are we maturing to that side of things that we can think that far out and that big for that long term? Or are we just going to think about as we've been taught now? It's well, it's what makes the near term profit now, what can be executed now, and what any agency or organization or individual or anybody can do now. And then that's it. Can we get a long term vision and can we act collectively for a bigger, the bigger thing that we need to do? Not, again, not suggesting that that's the only thing. All those, all those things on the ground, whether that's people in the community educating about what's out there or hunters knowing not to misidentify a certain species or managing harvest in an appropriate way on any landscape for the wildlife that's intended, all those things are also needed. Chris and I sometimes joke about uh, this concept that we call caribou time, which we, to us, it's just this uh, caribou seem to inhabit a different time scale than, than, than we humans do in terms of the way we view uh, or the way we understand forests and resource extraction and logging. Like, when we're up there, we see all this, what we think is good habitat, but in reality, a lot of it is not mature, and yep. caribou need, need, especially in terms of conservation, caribou need a ton amount of time mm -hmm. in order to stay as much as space for these forests to mature and for them to live in it. Was that, in terms of habitat fragmentation, was that a big issue for you guys? I think that, that definitely, understanding that their habitat was just being broken into pieces was was a big concern getting in there and feeling like that was an underlying reason for these caribou what were felt to be more abundant previously why they were in decline and barely hanging on and that was the that was the first big concern was habitat and so that was our first focus and what the research told us you know these are the six seasonal habitats as we've defined them and that can help us figure out how we need to manage. But I, th I think your point is a, is a really good one, is in particularly forests, which are 
are not like a lawn where we get up and go three days later we got to cut that lawn again for us we need to think in terms of generations and decades and and but forest management hasn't been built that way nor are are the organizations like people trying to make a profit and and employ folks those those folks are not operating on the scale of forest managed over decades or generations to support caribou so that goes to one of those bigger collisions of the of the time thing our time we're trying to actually speed it up and caribou are a classic of we need to we need to go to their speed to get to the insight to, to what it is they need and how they need it if we aren't able to do that then you know and that's why i think this project is great and some of the things you're getting at is 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 trying to tell that story and draw that picture that this is how we need to start getting to that level instead of oh we th we thundered in and we did three years of research now we got the habitats figured out and well there's only 32 of them now we need to just bring in a bunch and they'll be fine well that didn't work out it was not because it wasn't good intentioned and not because it wasn't executed well all those things were done well and all those things are normal best practice kind of deals but again it didn't address the things that, that you're implying to we need to sort of match the scale that they need i think both in in that time and the, and as you mentioned the space the landscape if uh, just not taking the Selkirk caribou in the United States is one, but caribou as a whole in BC, woodland caribou going all the way up, those need to be looked at as their entirety. I think if we if we focus on each one going out and what each one needs to do, we're that's a chasing our tail thing. We'll be telling that same story all the way up until they disappear.